Welcome to Preaching That Matters. A place you can find apostolic Pentecostal preaching. A place where all generations can be fed with the Word of God. We hope you enjoy. Amen. What do you say? We just make ourselves ready. Prepare our hearts. Amen. And Bishop Booker, you've been gone long enough. We're going to do this to you. We're, we're so glad you're here. We know you have a message for us, and we have a message for you. We want you to come, and we want you to preach the Word. Oh, let's love him together. I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You are so mighty, God. Such a good, good God. You to feel his presence. He loves his people, and he is here to do beautiful things. We're going to... Um, Go to the book of Luke, chapter number one. The book of Luke, chapter number one. I'm going to go to verse 26. It is so good to be here with God's beautiful people. And this is, uh, as you know, I go a lot of places. There's a song we sing, No Place I'd Rather Be, and I really mean that. Um, I'm not making this statement because I'm partial, but this is just, this is just, and it's, I love, I love this church, and I thank God for you all, all the time, all day, every day, thank God for you. Verse 26 of Luke chapter number 1. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. Now, we don't know what she was doing. We have no idea. She may have been praying. She may have been sewing. There's no telling. But the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we're mindful of you. We thank you for your presence, your grace, your glory, your might, your majesty. Quicken our hearts today. Make us alive to you and to your ways, to your will. Anoint us, give us ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. God bless you so very, very much. You may be seated. Now in our text, we, of course, are talking about Mary, the mother of Jesus, being visited by the angel Gabriel. And um, here, several months ago, I preached a um, message to you on uh, the subject, the most seminal moments in my life. And um, a seminal moment is a moment that it just happens, it takes place 
It may be something major, it may be something small, but they are, there are moments and not all moments are created equal. You're never quite the same after that moment. And um, so I talked about that. And um, here, and when you go through the scripture, most of scriptural history is dealing with people of the Word of God and the seminal moments of their life. I'm going to talk about, for a moment here, about Mary and that this moment of which we have read, I would very much venture to say up until this moment in her life, this was the most sacred moment of her life up to that time. And again, we do not know what she was doing. She might have been praying, uh, but she well might not have been praying. And, but be that as it may, here came an angel, a visitation of any angel is of import, but let alone the angel Gabriel. And, um, and the message that he gave this virgin girl that she was going to give birth the child would be referred to as the son of the highest. He would receive the throne of his father, David, and at the end of his kingdom, there would be no end, no end of his kingdom whatsoever. And um, we can only imagine this, this girl probably in her late teens receiving this kind of information is, is mind-boggling, is a mind-boggling concept. And I would venture to say that up until the time that Jesus Christ died, that was the most sacred moment of her life. But as she stood at Calvary, and she's seeing her innocent son crucified, and she probably did not think of it as a sacred moment because it was the fulfillment of the prophet Simeon when she took this eight-day-old baby into the temple and an old man came and he had been promised by God that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he holds this baby and he said, this child is set for the rise and fall of many again in Israel. And then he looks at her and said, a sword shall pierce through your own soul also. And at Calvary, no doubt, the sword was turning, churning, spinning painfully in her heart, soul, mind, as she agonized with him in his agonizing death. But as she would look back through the years, that was probably because there he shed the innocent blood the second and probably at that point the most sacred moment, painful as it was. But three days later, he rose again. Can you imagine her elation to hear he's alive? And, 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 and so then that probably was the most sacred moment of her life until she got to the day of Pentecost and she received the gift of the Holy Ghost. And now that child she gave birth to has come back to live in her again through the power of the Spirit of Almighty God. So her sacred moments in her life, one built upon the other. And um, again, as you go through the history of Scripture, if you're not dealing with the nation of Israel or with precepts, commandments, promises, and you're reading of, of, of the biblical narrative of, of the human beings involved that God used for his cause, his kingdom, those that walked with him in righteousness, it's a history of their most seminal but actually the most sacred moments. The word sacred means holy, hallowed consecrated, blessed, 
divine moment, a revered moment, a venerable moment, a sanctified moment. Amen. I made mention that I talked to you about the most, some of the most seminal moments of my life. And uh, please forgive, I made mention I would be talking about this. Uh, this is the second time I have done this. I just recently did this in Vicksburg, Mississippi. But I want to talk to you, and I have a reason, and, and we're headed somewhere with this. Uh, I want to talk to you about some of the most sacred moments of, of my life. And while I'm thinking, and while I'm speaking, you, I trust you'll be thinking, going back in your mind, of moments that were the most sacred moments of your life. If you're here and you're visiting today, and perhaps you've not yet had a most sacred moment, this could be, this day could be, up to this point in your life, the most sacred moment. There's only, uh, I had many times where God, I knew, spared me and visited me, spared me in a hideous car wreck, um, and I knew that my life had been spared, and my, uh, my car was a sealed coffin. I was standing outside of it, saw the police car coming. And the reason it was most sacred, I knew I'd been spared, and I just talked to somebody that knew everything about me and everything my life had ever, that had ever happened in my life, and that I had been spared for a purpose. And uh, on my mantel in our fireplace in our house today, the only thing I have that remains of that car, my brother gave it to me, is the uh, Spitfire Triumph emblem and the seatbelt buckle. And I, I, that's all that's left of that, but it means something to me to see that. And God spared my life. But the most sacred moment, sacred, sacred moment, and when that happened, I was, I was as drunk as Cooter Brown and drugged up, but I knew I'd been spared. But on January 20th of 1972, I had repented and uh, this is in the book, Journey of a Lifetime. And many of you have heard some of these things. But I had repented, and um, I was on a bus, but on January 10th I had received a poem. And um, the title of the poem is called I Am. I have the original, the original poem when I wrote it. I still have it. And I did not know that the name, that the words I am, or a sacred name of God. The title of the poem is I Am. Uh, I, I had repented, I'd be praying, and sometimes God would try to fill me with the Holy Ghost. I did not know what it was. I would uh, crawl under the covers with an old Bible and a cross that glowed in the dark, and I'd say, God, I don't know what you're doing. We'll have to do this some other time. But I wrote this poem, it said, I am. And the first line is I am, and the third line says Q, small Q, without, and then a capital you, Lord Jesus. I am Q without you, Lord Jesus. And I was feeling the Lord when I wrote it, and the significance of it is, as many of you know, of course, is that the letter Q without the letter U behind it is worthless. There's only two words I'm aware of, neither one of them are English. And um, one is the Gulf of Aqaba, does not have a U behind the Q. There's a scientific term of of um, QAT, cat, with no U, that's it, that I know of, and they're not English. And so the letter Q is worthless without the U behind it. And can I state to us that in the eternal scheme of things, our life means nothing. I'm sorry. It means nothing of eternal value without the great big capital U of Jesus Christ, amen, entwined with ours. That's where we take on eternal, lasting merit and value, is by taking on his name and his spirit through repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. 
And uh, so that was on the 10th of January, and on the 20th, 10 days later, I was riding on a bus on my way home from one downtown campus to the area of my house. And a uh, little old lady next to me, she said, oh my, what a beautiful sunset. And I leaned over to look, and I immediately pulled the cord and I got off the bus and I walked in in a dream because there in the sky with the clouds streaking the sun setting they were looked like lightning bolts on the side but they were orange various shades and they were pointing to a large black pure black cloud looked like it had been hit with a typewriter of a giant U, and off to the side, as if it had been a Q, was the emblem, and I saw that the U and the Q had become one, and inside, half of it was purple and half of it was green. And I recognized, I knew that God was telling me that he wanted to become one with me. I understood that. I understood that. And, and I walked as in a daze. And uh, when this church was being built, and it came to the point it was being painted, um, Adam, now Pastor Joel Booker and Brother Lance Myers, they said, we have something to show you. And they took me out into the foyer. And up on this side, there was the, there was the, uh, you with the Q, purple and green and the clouds. And they said, we did that for you. And I was so touched and so moved. And I said, this is really, really tacky. Can I ask you, is it, could you do me one more favor? And they said, well, I said, could you move it from there over there? And they said, we can do anything, of course. And the reason I wanted it over there was because when I was walking home, that's where it was in the sky. So when I walk out and I look up there, that's where it was in the sky, only much larger, obviously. And uh, that was up to that moment, the most sacred moment in my life. I didn't know what it meant. But in April of that year, April 2nd, I had repented thoroughly and was baptized in Jesus' name in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. And uh, April 6th, I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I was the reason that Brenda Lang and I were married on January 20th, 1973. We chose that date because that was one year after I had seen that vision. And so January 20th is an important day. Up to that moment, that was the most sacred, awe-inspiring moment of my life. But the next one was the night I repented. And I just recently did an online um, presentation to a church in Delaware where my pastor now attends, and, and um, I talked about April 2nd and my repenting and sobbing being baptized and then receiving the Holy Ghost. Yeah. That was the second. Yeah. And it became the most sacred moment in my life. And it still is to this day the most sacred moment. And it will always be, except for the next, except for the end of this message. That will be, except for one day, the most sacred moment of my life. Well, another one that took place, and this, this is found in, of course, the book, uh, Journey of a Lifetime. But I hadn't been living for God very long. We were uh, living in a house, me and my buddy Larry and, and um, his brother Eddie. And in a, you know what it is to be in a heavy, heavy, heavy rainstorm. But I'm this time, when it rains, when it pours, sometimes there, it's so thick back in Oklahoma. And, and it was just, I, I'd never been in a deluge like this. And I went out and I sat on the front porch in, 
I mean, on the steps, in the rain, being, I was out in the rain, whoosh, and I was looking, and the lightning, the exploding lightning, it just, it, it sounds like a cannon, and, and it's, it's, I hear you might once in a while hear a low rolling thunder. It's not that way back there. It's, it's, it's some, sometimes it sounds like someone is ripping the sky in two. It's, and you go, and I'm sitting there and there's lightning and, and, and when it would blow up white light and then all of a sudden it, but it was red. And I'm sitting there, blue, green, white. And I screamed, Larry! And so my buddy came out. I said, keep watching. And he saw it, blue lightning white, red, green. And uh, now there is, a, there is a, a real phenomenon. It's a scientific phenomenon. What happens is the rain is so thick. It's such a huge, heavy deluge of the water coming down that when the lightning strikes, the water works like a prism. And you can take a, 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 a quartz prism and, and uh, put it up to white light, and it will diffuse into seven colors, red, orange, yellow, uh, blue, green, indigo, violet. And so white light is made up of seven colors. And it speaks of the seven spirits of God, by the way. There's only one spirit. We know that. But there's, there's, there's things found in the spirit of God. Daniel had the spirit of wisdom. Elijah had the spirit of might. Uh, Moses had the spirit of, of uh, power. And, and um, others, Issachar had the spirit of understanding and, and things of this nature. But, but Jesus had it all. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And so when it speaks of the rainbow round about the throne... Amen. That is the diffused light, and in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Well, so anyway, I didn't know any of that. All I saw was this. <laughs> now we're standing out in the rain. We're in the front yard, me and Larry, and we're worshiping God, and the lightning's flashing. We didn't know that. And I know some of you have heard this, but across the street, down a couple of houses, there's an old boy down there. And he is looking out the window. Hey, come here. You ain't going to believe this. And here comes his family. Look at them idiots over there. And, and we were out there. Oh, we're worshiping God. And, and they're laughing and they're carrying on. They think they're crazy. Except for one girl, Nancy. And while she stood there watching us, tears were streaming down her cheek. Because she knew we were worshiping God. She knew this was very special. And so while we're out there, my buddy Larry, he said, just think, Jesus is the most powerful name in the universe. Well, the millisecond he said that, a bolt of lightning came down. It looked to me like it was as close as the back of the building there. And there's another scientific name for this, and they... It happens so fast, it's never, ever, ever, ever been caught on camera. But scientists know it's real, because there's been so many people that have seen it. But it's so fast, they've never caught it. It's where a streak of lightning comes down, and while it's coming down in its milliseconds, it will explode in the middle, and then proceed to go down. It's all in the flash of an eye. And he said, Jesus is the most powerful name in the universe. <laughs> It was like a cannon going off in my face. The lightning bolt, the ball of light, and I fell like a dead man on my face in the mud. And uh, so, eventually crawled into the house. The next day, I get a knock on the door, and I answer it, and there's this short girl standing there. And she said, can I ask you a question? I said, yes. She said, do you all go to church? 
I said, yes. She said, can I go to church with you? I said, of course you can. And the church was two blocks that way and two streets that way. Cut through the cemetery, and there it was. And she went, and she got the Holy Ghost. She was baptized in Jesus' name. And about the time that Nancy died of cancer, some of her paintings were starting to show up in the Smithsonian Institute for display. And, uh, but that's how she came to God. She, she had been in Vanita Mental Institution, and they let her go for two weeks. And while she was home for two weeks, she saw that. She went to church. She got the Holy Ghost, got baptized. At the end of the two weeks, she went back. They'd run a test on her, and they said, you're better off than we are, and let her go. So that moment in that lightning storm and Jesus, the most powerful name in the universe, that was an exceedingly sacred moment in my life. Another time of a sacred moment was in that house and the day that I opened up a letter from my mother and my wife and boys will tell you was one of the sweetest humans I ever met. I was fortunate to have her for my mother. And uh, when it came to things spiritual, it just, it, it, it never grabbed at her. I can't figure it, but it, but I was reading a letter from my dear mom, whom I'd watched her hair turn gray from my ninth grade year till my senior year because she would stay up night after night after night listening to the police radio, waiting for my name to be called, which many nights a week my name would be called. And um, her hair turned gray in those years. And uh, now I'm, here I am. I've repented. I've received the Holy Ghost. I've got the name of Jesus on me. I'm saved, and I was a... I was a crazy wretch. I used to deal with heroin from Vietnam and sending back LSD from Boulder, Colorado and shooting cigarettes out of each other's mouths and tin cans off each other's heads with 22 pistols and rifles and 70 fights, most of them gang fights, from my ninth grade till a year after I graduated. And here I am saved. I'm saved, and my now gray-haired mama is out there lost. And I went to my bedroom, and I fell on my bed sobbing, sobbing. And yet I knew that God was good, and so I remember scooting off the bed, and I'm praying, and I knew, I knew, I knew I needed to worship God because he'd been good. Lifting my hands was like lifting weights, way too heavy. I had to fight, fight, literally, to get my hands in the air. And with my hands in the air, I began to worship God. And then, while I was worshiping Him, the glory came, and I was worshiping Him, or worshiping him with great joy. And I felt something say, stop, listen. And I kept worshiping, stop, listen. And I finally stopped. And the Lord spoke to me three things. And um, only one of them, I'll tell you what he said. He said, I will use you if you follow me. And, um, yeah. And that was a very sacred, sacred moment in my life. And he also, I will tell you this, he promised me he would move on my parents. He didn't say he would save them, but he did promise me he would move on them. And I watched him do things moving on my parents. Another very, very sacred moment was in our local church, Bartlesville. And uh, we were about to take communion and I hadn't been living for God all that long. And um, 
and the thought of how holy communion was and how precious it was and and yet I was human and I'm thinking, oh God. And I was, I was like, I was, I was like, God, should I even take communion? I mean, I don't want to take it unworthily and die. And I was just, oh, and I knew how human I was. And, and uh, the presence of God swept into that church. And I will never forget in the process of worshiping God, people were everywhere. There wasn't many of us, but I went to the side wall, the, the uh, north side of that church building and I slid down the wall and I was praying and the Lord let me know take communion and his presence came on me and I was sobbing as hard as I could cry and laughing as hard as I could laugh at the same time now tell me how that works but it's the truth I was, oh. <laughs> and it was the same, and it was, I never experienced it, but it was, it was a moment so sweet, so precious, and that was the day, it was the December 10th, and I wrote in my little Bible, and I still have it, December 10th. On this day, Jesus showed me he loved me. And it was a most sacred, sacred moment. A few more. One was the night I knew I was called to preach. I was sitting at my house up the street from the church with my parents. I will just give you this much of it because I won't bore you with the whole details of it, but the man that was mowed, young man that was so intrinsically used in seeing me brought to God, drove all night. God spoke to him, said, arise, go get Larry. He's ready now. Drove from Bartlesville, Oklahoma to Pueblo, picked me up, took me home. Now my parents are there and it's church night and uh, time to go to church. And they said, Larry, we're leaving in the morning. And, um, I said, I've got to go to church. Bottom line, my buddy in front of my parents said, you don't love your mother and dad. If you loved your parents, you'd stay home from church tonight. You wouldn't go to church in front of my mom and dad. And I looked at them and I said, you know that when I was back in Pueblo, doctors tried to help me. Lawyers tried to help me. Psychologists tried to help me. Counselors tried to help me. Probation officers tried to help me. Good policemen, bad policemen, everybody tried to help me. Teachers, educators, God knows you tried to help me. Nobody could help Larry Booker. Nobody. But God helped me. And the main venue he used was his church. And I said, I'm not running the risk of losing what God gave me. And I said, I'm sorry, I love you, but I am going to church. And that was the night I walked into church. I felt so low, so bad. I don't know where it was, but I was reading in the book of Psalms. My pastor was preaching from somewhere from there. And while I was staring at the scriptures, I felt myself as if on a high, high, high dive board slow motion diving off, down, 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 down into the scriptures. I could feel myself meshing into this word. And that was the night as the tears began to drip onto the Bible. I knew my life was to be spent preaching this word. And it was a most sacred moment in my life. Another one was at a general conference in Saint, excuse me, Louisville, Kentucky. And while I was there, a man was preaching. It was the first time I ever saw the blue Shekinah come in. And I watched the blue Shekinah pillar of glory come into that place. I could see it. 
And when I lifted my hands, I began to bawl like a baby. I'm worshiping God and crying the riches of his glory. And then in the process, I, I lowered my, it was like, ah! I mean, it was like, I could see, but it was, ah! this really, I'm telling you, this happened. I thought, I'm checking this out. And it was real. It wasn't psychosomatic. I don't care if you think. I did that about 15 times. And then I just kept my hands up and cried like a baby. I'll tell you what God taught me that night. It means something to lift your hands and worship God, regardless of what you feel. He was letting me know it means something to him. It means something to him. This is why Jeremiah said, I will lift up my heart with my hands. So that was a most sacred moment. A prayer meeting that I had in Arroyo Grande where for 30 minutes God came. I've never had one like this before or since. Every single question I asked him for 30 minutes, he answered me immediately. I've never had a prayer meeting like that. It was one of the most sacred moments in my life. Another one was in a prayer meeting on my floor crying because I didn't want to leave Arroyo Grande and come here. And I think we'd already been voted in, but the thought of leaving Arroyo was killing me. And I was curled up in a fetal position, and I was sobbing. And I didn't know I was fixing to go into a most sacred moment. The Lord spoke to me and said, you don't have to go. And I wasn't expecting him to speak, and I wasn't expecting him to say that, and I stopped cold. I said, okay. Jesus, if I don't go to Rialto, if I don't go, if I don't have to go, and I don't go, what is the biggest thing I will face? What will be the biggest repercussion? What? if I don't go. And I wasn't expecting his answer. He said, the torment of always wondering what might have been. And when that happened, I wiped my eyes, I sat up, and I was done. Now, the day we drove out of town, November 3rd, that Sunday morning, I wept. I wept. But I didn't want to live with the torment of wondering what might have been. And God's been good to this church and to us. And he's just, oh, God. The most sacred moment. I'm going to skip one. I'm going to come back to another. Recently, and I told this to this church, one of the most sacred moments in my life was on a curvy, very, very curvy two-lane road in West Virginia where the Lord finally answered a question that I'd been asking him for over 40 years about the scripture, he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist. And after 40 years on a little curvy road in West Virginia, he answered me, and I preached on that, and so I won't have to rehearse that. But I pulled over the car the first chance I could and not get hit. Enough room on the side of the road and I wept because I understood, amen. It don't matter who you are, what your name is, he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. And Jesus said, of men born of women, there's no prophet greater than John. He that's least in the kingdom is greater than Isaiah and greater than Moses and greater than John. And it's not because of who we are, it's because of the gospel he's given us. But 
I'm going to retell this. It's one of the most sacred moments in my life. It was the death of Sister Genevieve. Little Sister Genevieve Jacob. Many of you, she died many years ago here. Some of the older folks, you remember Sister Genevieve. She was a sweet little lady. When she was 14, her father was a well-noted pastor in the Dakotas, the campground area where they have on the lake. He purchased all of that. That's where they have their camp meetings every year. I've preached that camp meeting a few times. She was 14. She ran away from home. She became a hopeless alcoholic. She lived a hard, harsh, drug-laden, drink-laden life. She had four daughters. Her world was upside down, inside out. Some of you know her daughters. And uh, she went to the church at Garden Grove one day. Brother Gerald Buxton was there. And that night, after casting devils out of her, she prayed back through to the Holy Ghost. And she became a saint of God. And so I became her pastor, technically, officially, November of 96, as far as being here on the site full time. And uh, the years went by, and Genevieve really enjoyed her, and she got sick. And so she was in the hospital. And uh, she was non responsive, she was on life support. The only person in the family knew it, and the doctors knew it, that she could respond to and communicate with happened to be me. And uh, the way she would, well, anyway, so they, they wanted to take her off life support, but they didn't want to do it without her full total acquiescence. And so at 9 a.m., I went up there and I'd been there late the night before. And, and so the doctors were there. Two of the daughters were there. And I said, Genevieve, I want you to blink your eyelids if you can hear me. I said, this is what we're going to do. If you want to say yes, Blink your eyelids twice. Can you try that? She went. I said, if you want to say no, blink your eyelids once. Say no. I said, okay, we're going to try this now. Say yes. Say yes again. Say it again. Say no. Say no. Say no. I said, all of the equipment that's on you, Genevieve. The doctors say this is what's keeping you alive. And without it, you will pass on, and you and I know you're going to be with Jesus. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Genevieve, they're talking about removing all of the life support system. Do you understand that? Yes. Genevieve, do you want them to remove the life support system? Yes. Do you want to stay on the system? No. And we went through that again and again and again and again flawlessly. And the daughters knew and the doctors knew she wanted 
off. We did it one last time. And he said, okay. We said, we're going to pray, Genevieve. Yes. And we prayed, and the doctors removed everything. And it was 10 a.m. at that time. They said, she'll be gone by 10.15 at the latest a.m. So 10.15 came. And 10.30. And 11. And 12. And 1 p.m. And 2 p.m. And 5 p.m. And 6 p.m. And 8 p.m. And 9 and 10 and 11 p.m. Me and the two daughters and 11 p.m. that night she went things flatlined and we began to cry I began to thank you, Jesus. It was at least 60 seconds later she went (sighs) and started breathing again. And now she's breathing. And the girls are... And um, at 11.30 And this time, we're waiting. It's over 60 seconds. And she goes, <gasps> she's breathing again. 20 minutes later, the same. And by that time, I knew what was going on. I knew. I knew exactly what was happening. And the girls did too. And so now it's after midnight. And they got by their mama's side, and they said, Mama, let go, Mama. We know why you're not letting go, Mama. It's because we're not living for God. Mama, if you let go, it'll be okay. We promise you we will live for God, Mama. Mama, it's okay. We promise. We promise in their cry. We promise, Mama. We'll live for your God. We promise. And she went, Ugh. And she did not come back. That was one of the most sacred moments of my life. I will never forget that moment. But the most sacred moment is ahead of all of us. Because somewhere, someplace, sometime, listen to me, we're going to breathe our last And we're either going to be with him or we're not going to be with him. We're either going to be saying hello forever or goodbye forever. This is why this could be one of the most sacred moments of your life. It's the day you say hello for the rest of your life. And you say, Jesus, it doesn't matter. Live, die, sink, swim. You're stuck with me. I'm walking with you. I'm talking with you. I'm taking you by the hand. Both hands. I'm not letting go. And we're going on forever. Now, why would I teach this this morning? Because we are living in some of the craziest times that the world has known of. But listen to me. And this ain't ain't negative. As far as the world is concerned, I'm not expecting it to get a lot better. Amen. 
And I'm going to take it a step further. From this day forward, you listen to me. We are in a horse race, dead level horse race with the Antichrist. We better reach like we have never reached. We better teach like we never taught. We better stretch like we've never stretched. It's not time to wring our hands. It's time to stretch them out. Because if we don't get them, the Antichrist it will. But here, two things. One, a woman with child, she knows it's coming to a travail time. But there is a joy. Set by. Can I tell you something? There's an excitement kicking in me. We're closer to being with Jesus than we've ever been. You hear me? And listen again. These days, God is saying, okay, you walk with me and you see what I can do. Let's stand. I was talking to Brother O.C. Marler the other day. Many of you know he does, a, he does a deal for HGR Radio called Thoughts Roundup. And he did a, he, he, he talked about a girl that he would prayed for when he was living in Dallas and God healed her. Well, I was talking to him and telling him how much that meant to me. And he said, Larry, I'm going to tell you something. He said, I'm going to tell you a story. He said, I haven't told very many people this story. And he said, because... It is so amazing. There's just a lot of people who wouldn't believe me. So he started telling me the story. I said, Brother Marler, listen to me. You have to tell this story. You have got to tell it. I said, we're in the last days. God is moving and people need to know what God's willing to do. Yeah. And I said, if you want to get on there and say, listen, I'm 84, five years old now. I'm too close to eternity to fool around lying. If you don't want to believe me, that's your business. But I'm not going to risk my salvation by telling something that's not true. This happened to me. He said, all right. He said, this is what happened. He said, I was pastoring there in Dallas. And a lady in the church called. I cannot remember if it was her son, but it was a family member. He said, Brother Marler, Brother Marler. He said, I'm going to say his name was Joe. He's been in a horrid, horrid accident and his body's burned horribly. He's in hideous pain. He's in Parkland Hospital. That's the hospital where John F. Kennedy died. And said, uh, could you go pray for him? He said, yes, I'll go right now. So there were different days then, and he said as he was approaching the room, he could hear the man screaming. He said the pain. He was, ah! And said the doctors in there, they're trying to work on him. And he stood there, and finally he said, please, sir, ma'am, I know you're, what you're doing. You've got to do. I'm a preacher. I need to pray for him. Can I pray? Yes. I don't know if he touched his bed. I don't know why. But he laid his hands and started praying. And the man was, ah! He said, it's gone. He said, it's gone. Oh, the pain is gone. And the doctors and the nurses are standing there. And the man's crying, thank you. Thank you. So he said it was the next day. And he was on his way to the room to see the man. And as he was walking, he went by the waiting room. And there was a, a group of people in there. Standing, and as he's walking by, he looked at them, and somebody in the group pointed at him. Pointed, hey, hey, hey. So he, he, he just kept walking. They came pouring out of the room, sir, sir. He turned, he said, yes. They came and they surrounded him. 
They said, are you the man? Are you the preacher that prayed for the, the man that had been burnt so bad? He said, yes. And they started talking at once, but here it was. These people were families. They represent my sons in ICU. He's about to die. My daughter, my husband, my aunt, my mom. They all had people in ICU in hideous conditions. Would you come and pray for my daughter? Pray for my mama. Pray for my wife. Pray for me. He said, yes, I will pray. Well, I see you as I see you. And so here they, here come these people. They said, no, you can't, you can't. You, we can't invade ICU. And, and he realized this is going to be a deal because the doctors were kicking up a fuss and the family was becoming frantic. Families. And he realized there ain't going to be no short, quick impasse. So he said, wait, 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 everybody, listen. Let's go out, let's go out. Come on, come on, come on. They went out. They said, we will wrangle for hours with that situation. God's able to help right now. Everybody hold hands. Okay, what's the name of your wife? What's the name of your son? What's the name and what's the situation? And it, does everybody get this? Everybody got it? Yes, yes, yes. We're all gonna pray together. Okay, we'll pray, we'll pray. And they all pray together. He said, Brother Booker, by the next day, God had healed every single one of those people in ICU. I said, oh, see, you've got to tell that. Because we're in the last days. Hey, the devil's putting his feet forward. You hear me? Get ready for some of the most sacred moments of your life. And these are the last of the last days. And he's going to show himself strong in behalf of those that love him and know his name and walk. If you're here today, maybe you've never received the Holy Ghost. This can become the most sacred moment in your life right now. If you're here today and you've never repented of your sins and told God you're sorry, right now can become the most sacred moment of your life. If you've never been baptized in Jesus' name, this can become the most sacred moment of your life. Hallelujah. If you've walked away from God, you can come back today and this can be the most sacred moment of your life. Up to this point, God can move. Hallelujah. If you would like to receive or repent or whatever, there are ministry that will come and pray with you. Folks everywhere, let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Hallelujah. God's here to do things for you. That's it. Come on. That's it. Come on. Come on, anybody. That's it. Come on, anybody. That's it. Come on. That's it. That's it, sir. That's it, man. That's right. That's it. That's it. Come on. Yes. Yes. God's here to help you today. Wrap me in your arms. Wrap me in your arms. I believe we're going to be entering into the most sacred days of the kingdom. Come on. Come on. Let's pray. Wrap me in your arms. Wrap me in your arms. 